Hi, I'm Dylan, and you're listening to the Animals at Home podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Animals at Home podcast. I hope you had a successful week this week in whatever you were trying to accomplish. Hopefully it was a great week. And last weekend, maybe you had a long weekend like I did. Obviously, it was Easter this past weekend. And I don't really celebrate Easter, but we did get a little bit of time off. And I had at least one day completely off where I had to do nothing. So that was really great. Hopefully you had some time to recharge your batteries as well. Joining me on today's episode is Sarah Dunsmore. Sarah is the co-owner, along with her husband Sean, of the company CDE Cages. CDE Cages is a small, family-run business out of Omaha, Nebraska. This is a cage manufacturing company that has been around for over 30 years, although just recently Sarah and Sean purchased the company for themselves about three years ago. They purchased it from the original owners. This was a really fascinating conversation. You know, the thing about CDE Cages is they are a small, family-owned business. It is built in America. and Caging is one of those areas that I think as animal owners we, we forget about because we just go to the store, you end up buying a cage and you kind of forget about the process that it takes to design and create suitable cages for the animals that we own. Sarah's company makes cages for a multitude of animals, lots of mammals, reptiles, birds, and they really have a very unique and very customizable operation. You know, one of the main issues in the pet industry, especially the reptile industry, is you can actually go to a pet store purchase an animal that will eventually outgrow any enclosure for sale at that pet store. Now this is incredibly odd to say the least. It, you're really just setting up an individual for failure because eventually their animal is going to grow into something that is going to be unhealthy in the enclosure that the store had sold them. So I mean really you're setting up the animal for failure and you're setting up the person for failing to care for their animal properly. And this is what is so interesting about a company like CDE Cages because they are sort of disrupting the enclosure industry in a way because they allow for a multitude of customizations that will allow you to develop and create a cage that is entirely suitable for your full-grown animal. So obviously with reptiles, a lot of them get quite big and we need to go bigger with a lot of these cages. And CDE offers a very lightweight, very simple cage design with as much customization as you could ever want. This conversation that I have with Sarah sort of shows their general philosophy where they have created this positive feedback loop between the animal owners and the cage manufacturers. This sort of they allow the owners to have a ton of input on the cage process and in turn the company learns how to build cages for certain species of animals, whether that's monkeys, birds, snakes, iguanas, whatever it is, which is exactly how it should be. So before we get into this conversation, a couple quick things. One, if you're not following me on Instagram, definitely go follow me. It's at animals at home CA. I am pretty terrible with my Instagram. I kind of forget about it. I, I'm trying to get better. I do find it slightly tedious posting things, so I'm trying to get better. So if you are interested in watching me try to get better, definitely follow me on, on Instagram. And if you are interested in suggesting a guest or you yourself would like to be a guest on the podcast, send me an email at podcast at animalsathome.ca and uh, we can start a conversation like that. Here is my conversation with Sarah. All right, Sarah, welcome to the show. Thanks for uh, spending some time here with me this morning. Of course. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, I've said plenty of times on, on the show that part of my goal with the podcast is really to make sure I'm having a wide spectrum of guests with different areas of expertise. And I think that you helped me fulfill that goal very nicely because the company that you and your husband run is gives you a unique perspective on the animal world. And I think it's one of those perspectives that we, uh, as outsiders, Cage manufacturing is not something that a lot of people are often thinking about. It's kind of one of those things that's definitely behind the scenes. So I, I for sure want to get into that because that sounds like uh, I think we can have a really interesting conversation and definitely educate some people on 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 that. But before we do that, I know we were chatting through email before and you had told me that, you know, animals have always been kind of part of your life. So can you give me just a little and the listeners a little background on, on your sort of history with animals? Absolutely. Um it's probably the favorite part of, of my history. Um, animals have just always been a part of my life. I uh, grew up um, similar to you out in the country um, in Texas. And um, we lived uh, on some acreage and kind of a trend in the area that we lived in, probably sadly all across the United States. Anyone who was tired of a pet or overwhelmed by a pet um, or pets that ran away, somehow there was like this bullet, um, this target on my family's driveway. And 
we would just get strays that would be dumped off and um, just somehow find their way. Uh, my dad used to always joke that there was just this um, underlying beacon where stray animals knew that they could come to us and that we would take them in and figure out a way. So that's probably how my love for animals started. We had a couple of just house pets um, and that number kind of fluctuated depending on uh, what was going on. And, you know, it started with dogs, cats, um, but my love for animals really wasn't limited to that. Um, my brother had kind of gotten into reptiles and fish. Um, and then uh, when I became a little bit older, I just continued to educate myself on, on animals and continued to, um, you know, just interact with animals. I met my husband um, in my early 20s and he had come from um, a similar background. Um, he grew up in the country and was raised around horses. Um, so the two of us together really just kind of combined our love of animals. Um, and when we married, we ha had dogs and cats and then we just kind of have expanded from there. We've had everything um, from dogs, cats, guinea pigs, chickens, donkeys, goats, geckos. Um, yeah, I mean, we really, there's almost nothing that we have not had um, over our 20 years of marriage. Um, so it, it, it kind of started out as just this um, exposure to animals. Um, and then the more I interacted with the animals, I realized how much they had to really give um, and how, you know, you just really cannot go about life in a bad mood if you've been around an animal um, and watched them uh, interact with their, their natural environment or interact with you. Um, so that has just kind of been this, this lifelong um, thing for both me and my husband um, and one that I don't really see ending anytime um, in the near future. We do have two human little animals um, at this point, um, but we've got a slew of animals at home right now um, as well. So we, we are going to continue the trend. Yeah, that's awesome. And yeah, I always think of, I think human pets <laughs> are the, <laughs> it's like the, the most advanced pet you can get, I, I imagine. <laughs> like as, as people who own animals, you're always looking for like the next hardest thing to take care of because you want to advance the, your ability to care for things. And I don't have kids yet, but uh, eventually that will be the goal. So so that well, is I can the, definitely loan you mine as a trial <laughs> run. I'll send them right up to Canada and just see how you do. But but agreed, um, they, they are difficult and somewhat um, not as rewarding as the animals because they talk back a little bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you'll learn that eventually. But they obviously, they must love being around the animals. Oh, my word. And it's such a, um, I have two little boys and they are bound and determined to be kind of the next um, crap brothers. They just have grown up seeing us and especially with our business now, um, we get an opportunity to just be exposed to animals we weren't familiar with um, beforehand and we can bring our boys along and um, on that journey. So they're getting just a kind of a bird's eye glimpse of the animal world and some real, um, real experts in the field, um, which is, is just adding to their love. So they're, they're kind of naturals with animals, um, but we're doing our best to really expose them to as many aspects of animal husbandry and just education as we can um, in hopes that they do great things for animals in the future. Yeah, that is, that's awesome. And I think that's part of it is when, when you are involved or are surrounded by animals at such a young age, it's pretty hard not to become just sort of enamored with them. I completely agree. I think there might be something wrong with you if if you avoid that um, that love for yeah. sure. No, definitely. So, so tell me about the sort of the thought process you guys went through. Obviously, you you classically you're not you're not trained in in an animal, at, or at least as far as I know, not in an animal sort of science or or, or vet or anything along those lines. But the, the process that you guys went through, where you decided to purchase this this business. Good, great question. Um, you, and you're completely right. Although we've always had this love and um, sort of connection with animals and we've done tons of work with animals just personally, um, neither my husband and I are, are trained um, in any sort of like animal um, education. Um, I actually am a professor on the side um, at a university. So um, I have a PhD in health 
Um, so that's really where I'm like classically trained. Um, and then my, my husband is, um, trained, um, in the business world and sort of entrepreneurship. So, um, as we were looking for something that we could, um, do as a business, either starting a business or perhaps looking at one that was already in existence, um, this, uh, this enclosure company came up and we saw it as a real opportunity to kind of um, match up our strengths and our passions um, and in a way that, that we could support our family, but also just involve our family. Um, so it, it was interesting for me coming from academics um, and the health world, don't, that, that doesn't seem to really correspond with um, owning a cage company. Um, but what I have found are the parallels that run between animals and humans and the, the same concepts that, that kind of I look at in, in the, the health world and in the health research. Um, there, there are a lot of applications that I can put into play as I'm talking with people who are trying to set up a home for their animals, um, you know, who are a part of their family and they, they treat, and, and as they should, they treat those animals like a member of their family or like one of their children and they want the best for them. So I started to kind of look at my job, um, you know, at, as selling cages from a different perspective and say, you know, what are we really trying to, to get at here? What are we trying to do for people? Um, and so with my husband's entrepreneurship and business knowledge, um, it just seemed to be a great fit. So we purchased the business about three years ago. Um, and it was, it was in Texas. Um, we were living in Omaha, Nebraska at the time. Um, so we moved the entire business um, up to Omaha um, and, and set it up. And it's just been a real blessing um, and a real education into and furthering our education with animals. Um, so that's kind of how it started. It started, a, a, you know, sort of randomly. Um, but as we've gotten into it, it's been a real opportunity to really connect with this community beyond, hey, do you want to buy a cage, um, which has been a blessing for us. Yeah, it's and that's really interesting. Like you said, it's almost you you really had to sit down and understand the direction that the the business was headed and sort of the purpose behind the business. And and it's so important. It's it's actually tough to make a move, especially as an entrepreneur, where if you don't have the sort of a a, a, a foundation of ethics and morals to stand on, like you need to understand what the purpose of the business is and and how is this going to benefit your customers and, and and whatnot. And obviously, that's sort of the some of the thought process you went through. Well, absolutely. I feel like, um, you know, people are smart and they can read through. I mean, nothing is more um, repulsive to me than just a hardcore salesman that is in it to make a dollar. Um, and that's not what either of us have ever wanted to do or we would have probably looked for a, a business that was more lucrative. You know, this for us was an opportunity to um, really show that we have not only a love for animals, but but a real care for the people and a respect for the people who are engaging with the animals. So we see it as sort of our um, opportunity to match up a, uh, an environment that's going to make it easy and going to make um, that person be successful in their relationship with their animal. Um, and people pick up on that. They don't want to be sold to, they want to be understood and they want to have someone that will meet them where they're at. So they, you know, maybe you've gotten an animal, but you're not exactly sure, you know, what the environment should be or how to take care of them. Um, we, we really just try to meet people where they're at and provide them with anything we can so that caging or enclosures are not what they're worried about. Um, they get to enjoy their time with what's important, which is their relationship with that animal. Yeah, it's definitely a really unique way to go about uh, an enclosure and a caging company because it, it's it's sort of offering a lot more than just here's the device you can put your animal in. It. It's more of like a, almost a wholesome and well-rounded vision of, of making the sale. So when when you, the, the company is called CDE Cages and and did you guys change the name or was that always the, the original name? It is close, but we did make a little tweak. I think um, the, the original company um, was started over 30 years ago. Um, and it initially started as 
C, D, and E. So what that stand that stood for cats, dogs, and everything else. Um, we found that ampersand to be a little bit problematic, for, you know, as we were moving our company into the world of social media and just the, the more simple, um, I think the better. So we did a little bit of rebranding right when we, we purchased the company and, um, and made that decision. So we, we tried to shorten it a bit to make it easier to remember and, and understand. Yeah, well, that makes sense. That yeah, definitely the having the and it just makes everything more difficult for googling and <laughs> and and is it on Instagram? Is it there or whatnot? So so other right. than that, and obviously you've changed the location. What what are some other changes that you guys have have made from the original to after you've purchased it? Um, well, I think probably the most significant change that we've made is is our focus um, and. We, when we came in, kind of what I was alluding to earlier, we wanted to, um, you know, this is our one shot at having our own small family business. So we wanted to do it right. And so when we, you know, we looked at the aspects of business, there's a lot of things um, that you can control. And then there's a lot of things that you can't control. But one of the things that we knew um, was in our hearts um, is, is this love for animals and how could we translate that? So I think straight out of the gate, we started to shift our focus to um, kind of a, a customer-based um, success program. And we started really uh, looking into people who were working on rescue um, because it just is an area with so much need and often so little support. Um, and that's really where this ball got rolling in terms of um, meeting people where they're at and, and kind of taking the stress and the, um, the, the unknown out of buying an enclosure, no matter what animal, if it's, you know, a mammal, a reptile, um, whatever you're working with, kind of figuring that out together. We've got a, you know, a wealth of history and knowledge behind us. Um, but we also started really changing our focus from, um, being these kind of um, absent cage experts that you could only, you know, contact by email and not really get any feedback to really listening to the people that we, that contact us and that we're working with to understand what they need and being willing to kind of um, adapt our product to that um, instead of the other way around um, and only offering a certain number of things. So we, we really have worked on customizing and listening to what people need and then trying to adapt our, our products from there. We still, of course, have our, you know, a, a lot of standard line models. Um, but I would say probably, I don't know, a third of what we do is just completely custom. People coming to us and saying, look, here's, and oftentimes it's in frustration, right? They just are at their wits end they want to enjoy their animal, but they almost are getting to a point where they, they can't because they see their animal either suffering or acting out or withdrawing. And um, so that probably was the, the biggest change for us was just our mindset and the way that we approached the people that we were working with. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really interesting approach. And obviously, it's what needs to happen because you... you at the end of the day, we want the animals to be healthy and, and to be thriving in these captive environments. And, and the enclosure really is one of the main pieces to that. So let, let's talk a little bit about the cages and we can kind of describe to the listeners what, uh, what type of cages were you guys are actually building. Good. Yeah, great. I know. And it's sort of an abstract concept to, to talk about. Um, and, you know, you can see photos on our website, but the kind of the main structure of our enclosure business is we work with um, two different types of pipe um, that we sort of make the frames of our enclosures. And we, uh, we use a PVC um, plastic and it's a one by one square frame is, is the, the pipe that we use. So we use um, either PVC or we can also do anodized aluminum, um, which is a, a little bit heavier duty or um, 
things that chew um, or nibble often in outside enclosures often use the anodized aluminum. Um, but a lot of our indoor stuff uses the PVC because it's so strong, um, but it also is so light um, and it's super durable. Um, so that's kind of the, the framework of our enclosures. And then the, the way the enclosures come together um, there are so many different options for that, um, depending on the type of animal, the number of sort of units that they want. And we, you know, we work with animal shelters and zoos and individuals and universities and, and all sorts of groups. Um, so that can be very flexible. But uh, the, the main component is once we build the frame, everything is um, panelized. So all of the panels are able to come together. So you've got when I, what I mean by a panel is a front panel, a back panel, you know, two side panels, and oftentimes a top panel and a floor panel. It would be a basic single unit. So all of those panels are able to be put together um, with just a couple of bolts and an Allen wrench. Um, so we, we have some fittings and, and things that we own the molds on that are specific to our enclosures to make them um, come together in an easy way for the customer, but in a long lasting and safe way for the animal. Um, so from there, our panels, we can customize them either with um, wire, um, and we've got a, a galvanized wire, um, but we've also got a PVC coated wire, which a lot of um, various animal owners are, are very interested in that. Um, and then we've also got solid, we use a, an ABS um, plastic uh, for our solid sides, but we all... So maybe we'll, we'll just start kind of back uh, from where we were. And for those who are listening, if it sounds like there was a bit of an interruption uh, in the conversation, it's because my power went out. So we are back. Uh, and I'll just remind you what you were, you were, I actually just went back to the conversation so I could remind myself where we were. You were just telling us about the sort of the different paneling. So you had just mentioned the, the PVC uh, caging and, or the, I guess, did you call it caging or, or netting? And uh, yeah, and then, and then you were just mentioning the solid panels as well. Yes, so we can we can do a couple of uh, different kinds of solids. We can do a um, we use an ABS solid pl plastic um, that is white and very very durable, um, or we can use a polycarbonate uh, for those that that want more of a, like a glass feature, um, which is nice because it is um, just so sturdy and so um, durable, but it's also light, which is really important, um, you know, just for the humans that are taking care of the animals. Oftentimes the weight of some of these, these enclosures can be cumbersome. Um, so that, that are, that's kind of the, the overview of what we offer. But we, like I said before, we are absolutely um, interested in meeting people where they're at and really educating ourselves. Um, so this is an education process in itself, just me talking to an expert like you and kind of learning what the new needs are or old needs or any needs whatsoever um, is, is, so we're, we're open to anything. Um, right. So yeah, it, it, and it seems obviously there's a, an, a sort of an immense amount of versatility you guys are capable of doing. You have, have sort of the sort of the template process, but because you can actually change the, the caging itself, you can almost, you know, I'm sure you've had every type of animal that have utilized the cages. Uh, all sorts. I mean, things that you would never imagine. I, we we built a 10 foot tall cage for a sloth that a lady had rescued. Um, and is, it, we've also done, um, you know, things for turtles that uh, are outdoor, like a 10 foot long um, outside enclosure just to protect and, and really give the animals a sense of their their natural habitat as close as we can get it to that. Um, and then coupling that with ease of use. Um, but we, we really, I want to re reiterate that we can do really anything. So for if someone has a special lighting feature or a special heating feature, we can oftentimes build those in um, at exactly the, the spot that it's needed, um, you know, venting. Uh, we, we just recently, about a year ago, um, designed and have had great success with a UV light holder. Um, we work with a group that um, they raise marmosets um, a lot of marmoset monkeys, um, and they were having a lot of trouble with 
their heat lamps, um, the way that they were attaching onto their previous cages, they were at an angle. And so it wasn't giving the nutrients to the, the monkeys um, the way that they needed. Um, so we've designed something to hold the UV. It's like a stand that can be put on any enclosure, not even our enclosures. Um, so that can swivel back and forth um, and, and really just kind of meet the needs of whoever we're working with. Um, but that's kind of the general sense of, of the, the frame of our cage. And then the sky's the limit really from anything from there. So then uh, in terms of, I, I guess everything obviously is collapsible and when you guys are able to ship everything out um, fairly easily, since it's not a solid structure, you can, it, you can build it with a few bolts, like you said. Yeah, absolutely. So it makes it easy for anyone to receive. So we do, we ship all over the world. Um, and, you know, depending on the size of the enclosure, we can go, you know, small like UPS, or um, we also can send it freight. So it often, it often packs up in long, narrow boxes. And like I said, all people need is an Allen wrench and the bolts, and we include both of those. Um, and then the other nice thing about that, the the panels and them being um, able to be taken apart very easily and put back together is cleaning, which is another gigantic issue we hear um, from the people we work with. Um, because a lot of enclosures um, are made from wood um, and I you know we have we have an enclosure in our home um, that we kind of use as a standby um, that's made of wood um, and I so I know there there is a time and a place for those but um, the nice thing about our product is that it is completely cleanable um, and it's not porous no part of it is porous so the ability to really sanitize is important um, when you're dealing with animals, especially if you're dealing with animals in a large quantity. Um, rescue groups, especially just, you know, containment of disease is huge. But for the individual, you know, hobbyist pet owner, cleanliness maybe isn't on their radar until it is in a big way because of a problem. Um, so we, uh, we've had some really, really good success and a, a great track record. I mean, I've got people, um, I had a lady call me um, probably two months ago that has had her cages. Um, she has two. She's had her cages for over 30 years um, wow. and just wanted some replacement bolts. So this is, you know, it's really an investment. Um, you know, our cages are, are going to be different from the ones that you can pick up at Walmart or uh, grab on Amazon. Um not only because of their custom nature, but because of, of that durability and the quality. I mean, we're really trying to just set these people up um, for success and then also for not having to, to shop for an, another cage again, unless you need an additional one. We, you shouldn't have to be replacing our cages with us. Um, and we don't, we don't see the only repeat business we see is, is people who are wanting to add to their collection and not replace Right. So, it's more of like a forever home type scenario. Right. Exactly. And we want to do it right the first time. Um, and that's why I I take a lot of time to understand the, our clients and what they're they're looking for so that we can do it right that first time and then you're on your way. So when someone has comes to you with sort of a custom idea, is it like someone or yourself or someone on your staff that just goes back and forth until you really nail down exactly kind of what they're looking for? Or how does that customization process work? Um, well, that's a good question. And I wish that I had a gigantic staff that was catering to the needs of the masses. But in actuality, it is my husband and myself that are, um, I'm usually communicating with um, people, you know, depending on how they reach out to me. Um, but through email and phone conversations, we will go back and forth until we get it um, right. And that often involves them um, Oftentimes we just have people that will sketch an idea um, and we encourage them to do that, to just sketch out what would work for your space, work for what you know about your animal. Um, and then we try to add our expertise in, um, you know, which is limited to our experience, but, but also the wealth of knowledge that has come from the various animals that this company, even before we, we bought it, was manufacturing cages for. So we go back and forth until we get it get it just right. Um, and then, uh, and then, you know, we move forward from there, but I do want to note with that same idea, another nice thing about these panels is that, um, 
and with us being a small family company. Um, we want to get it right, but understand that we, we are humans. And if we don't, there's always a solution. Um, the, so there's, there's, you know, benefits to the small biz- business um, and especially for the consumer, this is one of them that service is key for us. So I try to form relationships with the people that we're working with so that if they get it and there was some sort of damage on the way there or they've had it for a year and realized that, you know, I don't love the way I designed the door on the front of this enclosure. I wish I would have done it differently. Well, great. Let's replace just that front panel. You don't need an entire new cage and we've got your blue your blueprint or your design um, in our files. So it's it's a really customizable and um, user-friendly process is is the way we try to set it up. Yeah, though that is that's very cool. And so so in terms of the actual manufacturing, I think does it all take place in, in the United States? You guys do everything in-house sort of thing? We do. 100% in-house um, and it's all by hand. Um, we order um, the, uh, really the majority of our products come from, from the U.S., um, but we do it all here in, in Omaha um, and we just do it based on orders. So we don't hold any inventory because we really are trying to, we've got a, st- a, a couple of standard things that that sell regularly, um, but we we really don't hold any cages on inventory. We make them upon getting the order and, and making sure that it's right. And then um, we really stay so busy doing that. We we haven't had time to come up with kind of a, a inventory of standard cages. Um, but yeah, we've got a, a team here at the shop and I'm in the office with uh, my husband and he is kind of back and forth as the liaison between the guys out in the shop. And, you know, my kids are often out there. So it's just, it's a real small family business um, that what you would think of, that's, that's what's going on here. Mm, yeah, that's, and I, I think people really love to hear that, that, you know, the, the business and you're creating jobs for people as well, which is obviously very good. And so one of the interesting things about your cages is the, the concept of the open air. Now, obviously, open air doesn't work for every animal. And although, uh, I mean, a lot of listeners are, are reptile people, there's actually quite a few reptiles that can be in open air cages. Um, but of course, having the, you, you do have the option of doing the, the sort of solid panels as well. But can you talk about some of the benefits of, of the open air enclosures? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, we have done a, a lot of research upon um, getting the the company, um, trying to just educate ourselves as best we could about our own product and what we can offer people. Um, and there's been a tremendous amount of research that has come out. And this is why my, my degree in health for people um, has come in handy because, and, and I talked about this earlier um, with you, but this this concept of the health of the animal. Um, and that obviously is the goal for um, pet owners or hobbyists or people who are working in shelters or breeders or anyone who is dealing with an animal, they're, you know, the, the, the health of that animal is often top priority. And we find a direct correlation, and this is in the research, um, as well as just the, the feedback we get back from our customers, that the less stressed that an animal is, the healthier they are going to stay. So, um, you know, for rescue groups, that means not having to, to put put animals down to make room um, because, you know, they're, they're often flooded with all types of animals. Um, so we saw that as kind of, and still do see that as our opportunity to increase that health by creating an environment that is as close to natural as possible, um, and that just continues to keep them in a non-stress state. So, for a lot of animals, natural air is um, is one of the best ways to do that. And natural light, um, you know, natural sunlight is going to do a natural disinfectant on many of the diseases or um, just a lot of the ailments that can come from, especially mammals. Um, but we, so the, the wire and our ability to make our cages either completely open air or, or have maybe two or three sides that are, um, that are solid and kind of block the interaction between animals that maybe not, won't get along or are, are sick. So they've got that option, but then they've also got that option to get that fresh air in there, um, which just, again, helps with 
disease control and um, just overall wellness of the the animal. And we see a lot of people doing kind of a, a mashup of using the components of of the solid to you know keep keep the animal. Um, as quarantined as they can, but then keeping that that wire option open for the breathability, and um, and have had a lot of success. One in in particular um, is a uh, a standard that came out recently from Shelter Vet, the Association of Shelter Veterinarians, and they talked about the importance. Um, and this really primarily deals with mammals, but separating an area. Um, where the animal is able to eat and um, kind of hang out and lounge and drink, and then a separate area for urination, defecation, so keeping a litter box or or whatever that is in a separate area. So our cages have come in very handy for people in that kind of scenario because oftentimes people will request um, we can put in vertical dividers on like a long horizontal cage so that, you know, if you've got maybe you've got a setup where you've got two snakes right now and they they don't get along but you just want to invest one time in a in a in a large cage that's going to you know it's it's going to hurt your pocketbook a little bit you want to do it right the first time so you can get a vertical divider that's solid that can really house it and make it easily into without taking the whole cage apart make it into two cages or when you're ready um take it out. So there's a lot of versatility both with the wire and just with the solids in making as many options and as much enrichment and um, just healthy environment for whatever animal might be living in there. Right. Yeah. I mean, and obviously I'm huge on enrichment and and just listening to you talk, I I could just picture having animals outside is obviously a huge benefit you know uh, as long as the conditions are right it, the, the enrichment value is 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 really hard to hard to um you can't really overestimate it. you know it's it's really important to for those that have conditions where you can have an animal in the backyard um and i can just see these cages even if you have a winter where you can't have animals out there it would be very simple to set it up and and have uh, your animal outside even just during the day and you know i know that there, there's many large lizard species that I think these cages will work great for. Obviously, iguanas and and chameleons and and what are some? Do you have are there any other reptiles that you've seen uh, that work well in the cages? We have done um, a couple of uh, of like normal, what I would consider like in the frame of like normal reptiles, chameleons. Um, but we actually built a very very large enclosure, um, kind of custom built it onto something that. A lot of people in Florida call, I think it's called a lanai or a lan, it's sort of like a porch. I'm sure being in Canada, like you just don't have any clue of what that is because you guys probably don't have many. Um, but it we, we custom built um, a space. Um, it was a large enclosure for a crocodile monitor, which was a really, unfam- that was a new one for me and my kids. Um, so somebody that... Um, wanted, had the space and wanted to transform that entire area into an enclosure. Um, So that was probably one of our craziest, um, but we've done a lot of snakes. We've done um, some geckos, some, some small, um, but the the majority that we see are a little larger in scale. Um, You know, we've done a couple of bearded dragons um, and a couple of just, um, people who have various reptiles. So they knew exactly what they wanted in terms of requirements. And then they were going to kind of funnel in different species. And these were for some rescue, um, rescue kind of scenarios. Um, So we, we have, we've done uh, reptiles um, for sure. I would say the majority of our um, enclosures go to mammals, but really we are, ready and willing to learn what we could um, supply to the, the reptile community and, um, and are very anxious to hear from that community and, and serve them. So, um, well, it's, I mean, obviously if, if someone was using the caging for a croc monitor, that really speaks a lot to the, <laughs> the durability of, of the, of the cages, because those are not, they're, they're not nice necessarily no, to the, no. to their environments. They can be quite rough on things. 
Yeah. And, and, and we've, you know, that was several years ago and we've, we've had um, a tremendous amount of good feedback from that. Um, and, you know, we do, we're working right now on, with a large zoo in the U S to um, redo all of their bird holding um, for the entire zoo. So we do actually a lot of um, aviary kind of scenarios um, as well. So we, we try to be as versatile as we can without getting so versatile that we lose sight of the importance of each animal species and kind of their needs, you know, in terms of safety, health, enrichment. Um, so it's, it's kind of a tricky little balance of learning as much as we can and not, not going, to, not trying to do everything for everybody, but trying to do the right thing for the right people. Um, and that's, that's kind of our goal with that. Yeah, no, that makes sense. You don't want to spread yourself too thin, but it is very interesting. And I, I do think that, like I said, the, the idea of being able to bring an animal to a allow them to have natural UV rays, I think is really, it can be very important for them. And so when someone develops, designs a cage for a snake, for example, are they just primarily using the solid panels or are they using, uh, like, do you have quite small meshing that can be used as well? Well, we can, we've looked into, and, you know, I have a great wire distributor who is, um, I mean, they, they can, I can get any sort of wire. Um, we don't stock the small mesh, um, but we've had a couple of requests for it. Um, so sometimes I'll work with my wire distributor and he'll have, um, you know, like a small sample. So we've done some small mesh, but most of the time they're using solid panels, either the polycarbonate or um, that solid ABS plastic um, and have had, you know, no problems and we can do, I mean, I could go on and on about all the, the, the options we can do. We can even do, um, we have pull-out trays. We've got wire floor potential. We've got um, tops that can be just taken off of the base. So if you wanted to load the base, you know, and it can all be solid. It can, it can be, like I said, partial. Um, so there's really no limit to, to what we can do. Well, and I think really enclosures are, especially in the reptile industry, it's, it's one of those, there, there's not a ton of great options. Like there are, there, there are some okay options. A lot of them are very heavy and, or glass, but, but really it's, it's a strange industry because you can buy an animal from a pet store that doesn't supply an enclosure that would be suitable for this animal when it, when it becomes a full grown animal, which is just, uh, which I think is one of the reasons that there's so many things wrong with the pet trade. And there really does need to be an industry disruptor to come in and, and provide a, something different and something new. And there, there are a few lar larger snake enclosures that are made out of PVC that are quite popular and they do work quite well. But other than that, there's almost nothing. And there's been almost, it seems like no ingenuity in the last, like since the trade started. Yeah, and we we have heard that feedback um, and see that you know on a daily basis, um, which is a real uh, you know it's it's just unfortunate because then people get desperate and you know try to put some janky, for lack of a better <laughs> word, um, janky situation together that is going to be bad for everyone. It's going to be bad for the animal. It's going to be make them frustrated. It's it's just not going to work. So. Um, you know, we are trying um, to slowly kind of change that and, and let people know they, they're, they're the captain of this ship. You know, this is a journey that we want to kind of go on with them together. Um, and a lot of it is just education, both on our part, but also for people who are, who are just starting. Like, of course, someone like you, you know exactly what you need and what the animal needs and kind of what you have in mind. But a lot of people, as you know, when they start in, they just don't, and they will trust anyone. And someone who's working in a pet store, you know, as a part-time job who has no clue about the species of animal that, that they're turning over to this individual is not maybe going to be the best person to educate them on housing. Um, so we would, um, you know, I'd love to have a model and, and have something besides just a glass aquarium for people to choose from. Um, yeah, exactly. Like the fact that your snake enclosure is actually called a fish tank should give yeah. you a, an indication <laughs> that it, something is not right there. Some things are, some things awry for sure. But, yeah. um, it's, you know, it's a long, slow process and uh, being we're, that we're so small, um, <clears throat> like I said, it has a ton of great benefits, but it's, it is hard to change an industry, um, that, 
you know, thinks it's just been done for the same way for so long. Um, and there's a couple of giants out there that that want it to continue that way. So that's why, you know, we really appreciate opportunities like this where we can go in and talk to people, talk to consumers, figure out what they want, and then attempt to give that that to them. Um, so it's it's important and and what you're doing is important in that process, I feel like. Yeah, I the, I mean the the industry and not just reptiles. I think pets in, in general has gotten to a point where the sale of the animal is the most important thing. And then I, I think even like birds, for example, there you don't see a lot of big bird cages. And <coughs> I, you go into a pet store and there's a macaw for sale or, or an African gray or something that's just giant, and and you can't find a large bird cage for these things. So there needs to be someone that's sort of spearheading a, a quality enclosure that will allow people to have these animals. And, and care for them in the appropriate way. Absolutely, uh, absolutely, and we we hope to be able to do that and to to just listen to um, you know because even you're exactly right with some of these bigger birds and we do a lot of of bird enclosures um, and then when we get you know finally get to talking with these people there's there's differences even with these larger birds between the different breeds and. And so just having a contact person that they can call and chat about their experience or their expectations, I think is, is, is where we're going to gain some ground is at least that's what we're hoping. Yeah, no, for sure. So, and, and right now, obviously some of your biggest clients must be, uh, what would you call them? Uh, rescues. I don't know why I lost that word. Wildlife rescues and vets. And, and are those some of the, your, the most popular clients you have right now? Yeah, well, um, vets we are working on. You know, vets, their need is often for um, containing sick animals. And although we can do that, the sometimes the best case scenario for a very sick animal that you don't want it to contaminate everybody is like a stainless steel box that is not going to let anything, you know, through. Yeah. However, there are so many scenarios, especially with healthy animals, that that is not needed. Um, so, yeah. Uh, rescues, shelters are a, are a huge um, customer for us. Individuals, um, wildlife rehabilitators. I mean, we've got, um, we've made cages for bats and for, you know, pigeons and gophers and squirrels. I mean, raccoons are a, raccoons and possums are a, a huge, um, kind of a huge market for us. So we, um, but we are not, we're not, afraid to serve anyone. So, you know, we've got little grandmothers who just try to basically like save all the stray cats in their, their neighborhood. Those ladies call me as well as, you know, CEOs of, um, of zoos. So it, it really runs the the gamut in terms of who's going to call me on, you know, a, a particular day. Um, but I would say probably our, our biggest clients are rescue groups. Right. Yeah. I know it, um, it's, I, I guess as you start developing cages for um, sort of a wide variety of different species, you guys will have become more streamlined and sort of have, you know, this cage is designed for these mammals and these for these reptiles. And, and it'll be kind of a, a learning process, which is a really interesting way to go about it. Cause it's almost like the community is telling you guys how the cages should be. And obviously you guys have your own expertise as well. And it can combine into building something that's valuable for the owner and healthy for the animal. Well, in in our estimation, that's the only way to do it because we have um, been, we were set up with a good legacy of this company before we bought it. And then we've done our best to really take that, that stewardship and, and do well with it. And for us, you know, my husband and I talk all the time about, we feel so fortunate to have a business and want to keep one of our top priorities of doing it right so that when the phone rings, it's not someone who has, you know, lost an animal um, due to the conditions that were a result of our cages. And we don't want to have someone call and be dissatisfied or call us after a year or two years and have something break down. So although it takes a little bit more time and money, um, and just effort to sit back and listen and make sure we get it right. It's really the the easier way to do it, and it just from a an emotional, you know, an emotional point is we want to um, 
we just want to set people up for success and we want animals to, to be healthy at the, at the core of, of what we're doing. That is, that's kind of our, um, our touch point. So anything from there, if, as long as we're doing it right, anything from there can be solved because it's often just little, little things. Um, so it's, it's an easy way to do it and we enjoy doing it that way because we feel good about what we're doing. Yeah, and it has a it has a very real purpose, and I, and I think just jumping to, like obviously the the price point is higher, but I think that's really important. I mean, I think as besides getting the fact that you're getting a cage that's going to last a lifetime, that's that's sort of goes without saying. But you want people to realize that having an animal in your life is actually an investment. It's not just something that you can go get a, a you know ten dollar fish tank off of Craigslist and you'll yeah. be good. You, yeah. you want them to sort of have to think down the road, like, does this make sense? Like, this is the, sort of the setup or the starting of uh, the investment. Can I afford this right now? Completely. It's a it's a good check of, uh, yeah, am I ready? And this is what this entails. And that's, you know, one of our little taglines when we rebranded and, and you know, came up with a new logo. And really, we're just trying to um, focus on what, you know, what are we doing with this company? What are we trying to achieve? Um, and one of our taglines is, you know, we appreciate being able to invest and help you invest in the future of your animals. And because that's what it is, you're going to invest time, you're going to have to invest some money, you're going to invest your heart, your, you know, your emotions, probably your family members are going to have to invest. So we want that to be a happy and successful process. Um, and we're just honored to be able to be a part of that um, in any way that we can. Um, just jumping back to a question I just thought of just now, what sort of mechanism is used to uh, latch the doors? Oh, good question. Um, so we have a stainless steel, like marine grade. All of our hardware is um, stainless steel, marine grade. Um, so we've got a um, bar latch that that works well for the majority of our cages. We have a couple of different specialty um, latches that we can use depending on the if uh, on a custom design, but our standard is a um, high quality bar latch. Um, we can of course do locks, um, and like I said, we can do all sorts of things. And upon request, we can get almost anything. Um, but our our standard is a bar latch, um, and the only feedback that we've ever had from that is um, somebody who dealt with monkeys, and we we you know, we've done monkeys. We work with a great group called Monkey Helpers that use monkeys to um, serve people who are quadriplegic. So they basically go around the home and, and get, so we make cages for that group. Um, but there was someone who was dealing <clears throat> with a little bit larger um, monkey and they gave us feedback that that bar latch that the you know these larger monkeys I the name is for I'm forgetting what the what breed it was but they're like serial killer smart like they know um and raccoons can get a little tricky also so you know you just got to meet the animal where they're at and find out kind of where they're going to push the buttons and and you know and then we we kind of adhere to to whatever is needed in that specific scenario yeah, when the animal has thumbs, it sort of opens up a whole other ballpark. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep, yep. That's, yeah, that's, that's awesome. the deal breaker. Yes, for yeah. sure. What uh, do you have? Some of, you must have some favorite stories that you've you've enc encountered along the way with uh, some of the way the cages have impacted animal lives. Oh well, um, you know, first of all, just working with um, rescue groups, I think, has a ton of just. Um, emotional feedback that that comes back um you know we we hear from our our clients um but sometimes we don't which i don't really think is a bad thing like if no news is actually sometimes good news cuz oftentimes it's just human nature you don't take the time to to call the company to say hey i just wanted to let you know things are going super great um and so we don't get you know a ton of of, of calls back um, from clients. And that often means that they're happy, but the ones that we do are often very meaningful. And those, those come from often the most like disadvantaged sort of scenarios that you can think of where, um, you know, animals were being mistreated, whether it be reptiles, mammals, I mean, all sorts. Um, 
you know, because rescue work goes on in homes. It's not just the shelter that you walk up to. Um, it's the, you know, the snake that gets turned over after two years because it's grown and people don't, didn't invest in the very beginning. And so they're set up for failure and then they just want to quit. Um, so, you know, we see a lot of like heartfelt um, animals who have become healthy or you can just tell that they're happy. Um, but a lot of just normal, I think that turtle cage that I referenced before um, is perhaps one of my favorites because I wasn't before working with this lady and she was super sweet. Um, she lived in California and I wasn't as familiar with turtles as I am with some other species. And they, um, you know, she mentioned that they were about to come out of hibernation, which I just was like, wait, wait, what do you, and you know, she kind of described their size and that they basically go into a box in her closet and, you know, just this entire, and then she sent me, um, and I think there's a, a picture of, uh, even a video of that cage on our YouTube channel, but, um, seeing a turtle be able to explore a, a large 10 foot space outside, um, with, you know, rocks below its feet and, um, but be, to be fully protected um, and to, to be able to see kind of emotion in a turtle as it's walking around its space is um, strangely rewarding. You know, it's just we're doing our job when things are going smoothly and, and really nobody has anything to say. Um, you know, there's there's crazier um, animals that that we have built enclosures for, but it's often just the the everyday individual and their everyday pet or animal that, um, that makes the biggest impact on us, I feel like, and lets us know we're doing it right. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I always say is you is if you set your animal up for success, they will reward you by just displaying their natural behavior. Yeah, and 100%. it's one of the reasons that we all love animals because you, we love to watch them. You don't love to watch them pace back and forth in a cage. Like that's, that actually stresses most people out because you yeah. realize something's wrong here. But yeah. being able to watch an animal explore and, and get into a, a, a new environment is, is the most rewarding thing. And it should be everybody's goal, really. Yeah, a hundred percent. There's a gentleman that, um, he rescues wild, just wildlife or exotics that have maybe been given up. And, uh, he has, a, and you'll have to like, correct me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, a Kodamundi or a Kudamundi. Do you know what that is? Oh, uh, is that one of those small, uh, is it like a little mammal? Like a little, yes, it's uh, a little mammal. It's like halfway between a raccoon and um, sort of like a kangaroo and an yeah. anteater. It's very bizarre. Um, but the you know he always sends me videos of his animals in the enclosures that we built, and that same thing, seeing an animal free play in their space and really call it home um, feels good. You know it, and a lot of. Um, we, we did some work for a lady who has a, a really large um, cat boarding facility um, up in Northern California. And she sends me emails and photos all the time of they will leave. So they buy like big banks so that if they need to separate, you know, cats from other cats or other, you know, various things they've got in there. So she'll leave the, the doors open and these cats voluntarily want to be in there. You know, they, they're not being kept in there. They feel comfortable and they feel safe and they see, feel secure. And for us, that is a job well done. If we've, you know, created a habitat that feels like home for these guys that, you know, we, we as humans get the, the honor and the pleasure of observing and, you know, and having that stewardship of taking care of them. Um, so it's, it's a really, really rewarding um, business, even though, you know, like you said at the beginning of our conversation, cage manufacturers, you wouldn't really think that a, a conversation with somebody who makes cages, you know, could be like emotional or, but it, it truly is. And we're working with people who, for the most part, really care and feel the same way we do about animals. Um, so it's just a win-win. It's just, it's really the best job in the world. Yeah, no, and it's, owning an, animals is a, obviously a privilege and that the cage that you keep them in is is really one of the most important parts to it. And so I think it's a really interesting way you guys have gone about it. It almost flips it on its head a little bit where the, the, the environment that you keep the animal does really need to be one of the main focuses, even prior to the animal even 
being there. That's it's, mm-hmm. it's really important. So um, I really, really appreciate you spending the time and, and dealing with the power outage and everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> can you let everybody know where they can find you guys? Yes, absolutely. Um, our our website is um, CDE. Remember cats, dogs, and everything else. CDEcages.com. Um, and we've got links to our, um, we've got a lot of YouTube videos that show various models or some custom designs that we put together, um, but also some of our features. Like we've got a rotating um, feeder for for birds or any animals that might try to sneak out really quickly when you're opening a door. So those kind of things, you can see how they work on our YouTube channel. Um, And then we've got Facebook and and Instagram as well. But you can call me, you can email me. Um, Even if you're not interested in, in buying a cage. That's not really what I'm concerned with. If you want to chat, if you want to give me some feedback about things that you think are necessary or missing in, in, you know, out there, then I I would welcome that, that sort of feedback. So we are always available and um, would, would really be happy to hear from anybody. Yeah. So if anybody has a really any animal, but, but if they have feedback and, and, and ideas that, that, I mean, there's so many different creative people out there. I'm sure any idea is definitely worth looking at. So yeah. uh, you, they can reach out to you and, and then uh, you can kind of go back and forth. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it was a pleasure chatting with you. I, I really appreciate you coming on and, uh, and thank you very much. It's my pleasure, Dylan. And I just want to thank you for what you're doing. Um, I think it's a really special niche and something that's really necessary. Um, so you're doing great work and I want to um, just encourage you to, to continue. But I, we appreciate the opportunity to come on here and um, it was really good talking to you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for listening to that episode. I do really hope you enjoyed it. I am fairly certain that designing and building animal cages with, is on my list of dream jobs. <laughs> I know that when I'm building my own enclosures for my animals that I just have an absolute blast doing it. I love designing it. I love kind of putting my mind in the animal's mind and trying to picture what they would use and where they would go in the the enclosure. So I'm definitely jealous of someone that gets to do that on a daily basis. So Sarah, thank you so much for joining me. Not to mention the amount of animals that they get to interact with on a daily basis. I mean, monkeys, parrots, reptiles, it sounds incredible. Definitely go check them out. I have everything in the show notes, their YouTube, their Facebook, their Instagram, and their website. Of course, everything is there. Sarah's contact information is on the website. If you want to reach out to her, if you have some ideas for customizing cages, or if you yourself are looking for a cage, definitely reach out to her. She is incredibly genuine and nice, and we really had a fun conversation. And sort of bookending the actual conversation of the podcast. There was, you know, probably 10 minutes on each side of just Sarah and I chatting back and forth. We really did enjoy uh, having a conversation. So again, Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you guys for listening to the episode. If you want to go to iTunes or the podcasting app on your Apple device, definitely think about giving the show a rating. I would love a five-star rating if you are enjoying the show. And uh, I think that is all. So I will talk to you guys in two weeks. Thank you very much.